Thank you, Tony. Good morning. My name is Jane Ford, and I'm the worship associate for this service. Welcome to First Parish Kingston. Whether it's your first time or your thousandth time, I'm very happy to welcome you. It's so good to be together and to have Liz Stella Ford as our guest speaker. And in full disclosure, Liz is my beloved daughter-in-law. Some of you know that. As Unitarian Universalists, we are a people of diverse beliefs, but we share a common faith, a faith that every person is worthy of love, that what we do in and for this world matters, and that we are connected by an interdependent web to one another and to the earth. Whoever you are, wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. In a moment, we'll light our chalice, but first, there are a few announcements. First, this Wednesday, May 29th, at 6 p.m. in the Beale House, we're hosting a neighborhood meet and greet with the new Kingston Chief of Police, specifically to discuss Main Street traffic issues. Everyone is welcome to attend. And for those of you who have nearly been hit by a car trying to get to church, you might want to be there and see if we can lower the speed limit. Next Sunday, June 2nd, after coffee hour, the governing board is hosting a listening session regarding the Mass Historical Commission guidelines. This came up at the annual meeting when we were discussing the funding needed to pay for the repair of our roof, the meeting house roof. There will be an email going out this coming week with a link to the guidelines if you want to read them ahead of time. Please come and share your questions and concerns. And June 15th is our annual yard sale. We need volunteers to help. There's a sign-up board at coffee hour, and we specifically need help for the following times. Friday, June 14th, set up from 12 to 6. Saturday, the day off, set up from 8 to 10 a.m. And Saturday at 2 p.m., breakdown and volunteers to take unsold items are needed to savers. And lastly, um, following the service, we have coffee hour right across the street at Beale House. So please join us, get to know some people, renew all friendships, I hope to see you there. And now, let's take a deep breath as we begin our service. I need one more. This morning, Liz is going to light our chalice with these words by Christine Robinson. We gather as a welcoming community to honor the sacred in all of life, to foster spiritual growth, nurture curiosity and learning, and build a just, compassionate, and sustainable world. Liz will has lit the chalice at these words, continued, we gather this hour as a people of faith, with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest, and truth and meaning, in celebration of the life we share together. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn, when our hearts are in a holy place, number 108 in the gray hymnal.
is going to do this morning's reading. The Gift of Remembrance by George Tiger, U.S. Army Chaplain. I met Scott's father a year after he was killed. It was a pilgrimage for me. I drove a thousand miles every moment wondering if he'd see me as a symbol of the system that had taken his son. When he and his wife met me in their front yard, Mike and I hugged tightly for too short an eternity. As an army chaplain and therapist, I understand the spiritual, psychological, and physiological foundations of trauma. I can talk for hours about the body keeps the score, about vagus nerve response, about flight, fight, freeze mechanisms. I can reflect with you about the spiritual meaning of loss, grief, and suffering, how they felt in your life, and how they can burden the soul if held tightly. I understand all this, and yet not a day goes by when something doesn't bring in mind a young life now gone. Ghosts of what might have been my everlasting companions, I will not let them go, for I fear if I do that I will forget. I'm greeted with, when least expected with waves of unbidden grief, a tightness in the throat, vision blurred, a bit by welling tears, a little tremor in my hand, all things that remind me I cannot and will not forget. How many children lost? How many parents grieve? These memories, these ghosts, are necessary reminders of the futility of war and the desperate need for peace in our world. The memories which come upon me not as thoughts but as bodily sensations have deepened my compassion and steeled my commitment to bring peace to the suffering world. I serve in the U.S. Army. I support the readiness of those who have and will fight and win the wars our civilian leaders call us to fight. I love the people I am called to serve, knowing full well the dreadful reality we will one day face again. How then can I speak of peace? This is the difficulty of a holiday like Memorial Day. Memorial Day is not to be celebrated. It is to be observed, scrutinized, and witnessed on behalf of the true witnesses of our human failure to love our neighbors as ourselves. They are the ghosts now, haunting lives with gifts of remembrance so that we will not forget their lives, their living. But even more, the grief of the remembering will create in us a yearning for peace that will stir us to action. Gracious God, living spirit of love, Give me compassion, steeled with commitment, that I might become your peace given in loving sacrifice to our troubled world. Thank you, Bob. Now it is a time in our service where we, for the offering. When we give, we say yes to something we value. In this congregation, we take up an offering each week to say yes to the values of our UU faith and yes to this beloved community. And while the collection is being taken, oh good, and we have them coming now, um, our choir will sing our anthem called Sing with the Lark.
And now Liz Stella Ford will share with us her thoughts on Memorial Day. Well, hello. <laughs> this is my thoughts on Memorial Day. It started two weeks ago, the big build-up to Memorial Day. The ads started, home goods on sale, mattresses too, and sales of comfy sheets to cuddle up in, safe in our beds. It's that time of year for barbecues with friends, the official start of summer, three-day weekends and travel plans. Small town parades right down Main Street with men and women in military uniforms, flags flying in the breeze. We wear red, white, and blue, and we applaud as they march by. That's how it felt for me. It seems like a Norman Rockwell painting. Pretty as a picture, but ironically, I missed so much. Their point of view, the service men and women who sacrificed so much for our three-day weekend. I'm afraid I didn't understand Memorial Day and pride in my country until I was shown by real service men and women who served and saw themselves and saw for themselves. I truly got to look at what it means to them and try to understand what I took for granted. All those clean sheets and comfy comfy mattresses and get-togethers with those I love. Those parades, I saw them in a new light, something deeper, something real. There's something in their eyes. I see it. Only veterans understand it and feel it. This is how my gratitude and knowledge for Memorial Day evolved. Let's start. Francis A. Stella, private. 15th Interceptor Fighter Squadron, U.S. Air Force, Texas. He was my dad. He enlisted at 19. He wanted to fly planes. After quali a few qualifying tests, they realized he was so severely colorblind, he was unable to pilot a plane for fear that he would hit the wrong button or aim at the wrong target. Next, he tried to be a paratrooper. He wanted to jump out of planes. He was too skinny. They feared he would drift away. He was too light to maneuver a parachute properly. Finally, he found his place in the Air Force as a mechanic. He learned planes from the inside out. When he enlisted, America was between the Korean War and Vietnam. My dad did not see action, but he did see things that challenged him and made him think of those who served and didn't come home. Stationed in Texas, while planes were coming in, a sandstorm blew through the base. One of those planes was taken out of the sky from the storm. It took two days for the storm to end, and they could, could recover the bodies and the wreckage. He never forgot them. They were part of him, and they were a part of me. Nurse Teresa Gale Stella, H3M, United States Naval Hospital, Chelsea. Raised in Whittemore, Iowa, she enlisted in the Navy on August 27, 1956. She had never even seen the ocean, but she joined the Navy. <laughs> Terry was a Vietnam-era veteran. She was proud of that. Her time in the service fostered a lifelong career with nursing. She held the stories in on what she experienced but her pride she did not hold in. She was my stepmom. She taught me that pride. Her story is a part of me. Another experience I had when I was backpacking in Europe in 1987, it was the 4th of July. I was in a bar in Greece, and two twin brothers on leave from the army joined me. The two men, the Bartel twins, sang every patriotic song at the top of their lungs for all the people in Greece to hear. Between the songs, they toasted servicemen that they lost, friends, brothers. They were a part of them. They felt their loss deep. 
I was honored that they shared their stories with me. I felt them, and now they are a part of me. I don't know whether it was me being homesick or getting a taste of their patriotism, or if it was their off-key renditions of every song, but it affected me. They were all in. They meant every single word of every single song. They toasted the brothers that did not return. They stood for the national anthem, and they serenaded everyone around them from that encounter with these brothers and being far from home. Every time I hear the national anthem, my eyes well up with tears. I will never forget them and their stories. They are now a part of me. Later, on my backpacking adventure, somehow I ended up in Normandy, France. There's where I met John. John was an older American serviceman, retired. I regret I only know his first name. I met him in Normandy. He made his way back to the beach where his whole life had changed. He was a young man that served his country, roughly my age when I met him. John had explained how he was a paratrooper, and on one faithful day above that beach, he jumped out of a plane with all his buddies. He drifted in the wind, wishing for a quick landing. He watched his friends get shot around him. With tears in his eyes, he told the story. He was reliving it at that moment in front of him in living color. There was something distant in his stare. John told me that his friends were shot out of the sky like clay pigeons. All he could do was say a prayer for them and for himself. He cried. I cried. He was an older man looking back on his life in serving his country. He came back to that beach to honor those men that were lost that day, his friends, his brothers. To honor that young man he was and the parts of himself he lost that day. I stood there, tears in my eyes, starting to understand what it means to serve and the cost of the ultimate price paid. He shook my hand, he gave me a nod, and was wheeled off by fellow veterans to go pay homage to his fallen friends all these years later because he had promised. He had promised them, he had promised himself. He had to, he did. They were a part of him and now they were a part of me. I saw something in his eyes. For the first time, I noticed that look. It was far away. He was way back in time. He looked at the fellow vet as he approached John's wheelchair. He had that look too. I was starting to understand that they had shared something, a visceral memory, reliving, bringing back the dead, back to life, a reverence that I could only witness but he could feel. It was a part of them, and from that moment, it was a part of me too. Private Gerald Maloney, World War II medic, and my husband's uncle. He was on tour from North Africa to Sicily, then under General Patton's command, he ended up on Anzio, Italy. There at a battle, he was severely wounded and only 19. But being a good son, he sent his mom the following letter displaying all he had been through. Dated February 9th, 1944. Dear mother, I suppose you've been notified about me. I only hope you weren't worried. I got a little shrapnel in my left hip. It isn't too bad. I consider myself lucky. It's good to be in a nice, clean bed with good food and swell attention. I've been here for about two weeks. It gets a little tiresome only to be able to listen to the radio and smoke. I probably won't be in the hospital for too long, and God only knows how long it will be until the mail catches up with me. Give my best to Johnny, and I will write again soon. Love, Jerry. Healing from, oh, 
He stayed in that hospital for months, healing from wounds that his mother knew very little about, healing from experiences she would never know, thinking about people that gave their lives in service. He was an older man looking back at his life in service. His body carried the shrapnel for the rest of his years. His heart carried the memories of fallen soldiers and brothers. He held back the stories, but his eyes had that look. He had seen, I had seen in John's eyes. He didn't share much of what he had seen, but we all had known he had seen a lot. We just didn't talk of those things. They were a part of him, and now they're a part of me. Frederick Martin Joseph Sheenan, Jr., First Lieutenant, Company F-38, Engineer Regiment, World War II, 1946. Second Lieutenant, Artillery, USAR, Korea, 1954. I called him Freddy. I cleaned his house. He was an upbeat guy, and coincidentally, today is Freddy's 99th birthday in heaven. He was tall and talkative. I would chat with him as I cleaned. Freddy's TV was always on full blast. No doubt it was, about, it was from his days mind sweeping. He didn't have a license when he was drafted. They asked for drivers to sweep for mines. He volunteered and they gave him a license. Mind sweeping definitely affected his hearing. I'm sure his upstairs neighbors could verify. Freddy talked about D-Day. He was on a Higgins boat. It's a landing craft. The boat would head to the beach, drop a front ramp, and the men would run off onto the beach. These boats made it able for troops to be put in strategic spots to launch attacks. Freddy saw the first boat approach the beach, then the second. He was on the third. Freddy watched as these first two groups of men drowned because their boats deployed ramps in water that wasn't shallow enough. The men ran off. The weight of their gear was too much. They had drowned in front of him. His boat was next to reach the beach. When Freddy's boat hit the beach, he hit the sand. He ran like hell to a foxhole. When he got there, he looked next to him and saw a dead German soldier. The story was a regular recap from Freddy and a part of him and it is a part of me. He was an older man looking back on his days in the service when I knew him. Freddie had a coffee table book of World War II. It was his prized possession, and every time I was cleaning, the TV blasted in full volume, and he would flip through those pages. His hands made their way across the photos, slowly touching them, moving down the page like he was studying them or trying to make sense of them, or touch them through the pages to make peace with those photos and the stories. He had that look in his eyes. His body was in the room with me, but he was back there and he saw the people he had lost. These stories have given me a tiny glimpse of what Memorial Day is to those who know, like really know. They have lived it, they have pride, they have sorrow, they have that look in their eyes that I can see, but only veterans feel. On this Memorial Day, these stories I share are a part of me and now a part of you. Please try not to take for granted this day, its meaning and all that goes into clean sheets and comfy beds in a safe, warm place. If you have served and you are serving, be safe and thank you. I'm grateful. But for those who are lost on Memorial Day, it's your day. We honor you. You gave the ultimate. And I'm sorry I've taken you for granted. I didn't understand, but I'm trying. Rest easy and I thank you. Today is your day to be remembered for all you gave us and we could sleep safe in our beds. Thank you.
Thank you, Liz, for bringing us all to tears this morning. We appreciate it. Okay, our closing hymn, and, and rise if you choose, is called We'll Build a Land. And it is in the gray hymn, I'll I just check, <laughs> number 121. Thank you, Tony. This morning's benediction. Gracious God, living spirit of love, give us compassion, steeled with commitment, that we might become your peace, given in loving sacrifice to our troubled world. May it be so. And may I see you across the street. Thank you all for coming.
Nice combination there, Tony. Thanks.